Hello and welcome to Frankly Speaking, where we dive deep into regional headlines. I speak with leading policymakers and business leaders. I am Katie Jensen. On this week's episode, we speak with Dima Al Yahya, the Secretary General of the Digital Cooperation Organization, to ask how much the global digital divide is costing the international economy, what can be done to resolve it, and who is most at risk of being left behind. Plus, as a female pioneer in technology in Saudi Arabia, we ask her what's needed to build more inclusive tech ecosystems worldwide and why we need more female leaders in STEM. Ms. al -Yaya, thank you for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. Now, more than a third of people globally do not have access to the internet. That's roughly around 2.7 billion people. So what role does this lack of access play in perpetuating social and economic inequality and hindering economic growth? How do you think it's impacting education and workforce participation, particularly for disadvantaged groups? And who is most at risk of being left behind? What a very important question, Katie. And I would say that over the past two decades, the digital economy has been growing in an unprecedented rate. Now becoming the backbone of our societies, bringing people together, offering infinite economic possibilities, yet, increasing divisions and frictions in every scale. A thriving digital economy is critical to achieving sustainable economic development. But unfortunately, as you have mentioned, 2.7 billion are not connected and don't have access to internet, which is in, in turn is creating a digital divide that needs to be addressed today. We have already seen many co companies and, and countries as well uh, struggling to digitally transform with sufficient speed to keep, up, to keep up with the pace of change. We're missing out on an abundance of economic opportunities and social prosperity. We cannot fully realize the opportunities and address the challenges of the digital economy through individual national efforts only. The vast transformative potential of the digital economy can only unfold fully across borders. And therefore, cooperation is really important in that aspect. This means that we need to align our efforts and collaborate together to accelerate the digital transformation and promote, promote common interests as well. While developing harmonizing data sets for safer cross-border data flows, and also as well uh, a trade and digital taxation and harmonizing the policies and regulation that would help uh, uh, um, uh, innovators and also enterprises to cross border very freely and fastly and make technologies available uh, to whom needs it. Uh, so helping these efforts uh, to have efficient uh, uh, accelerated goals to achieve social prosperity and fuel growth uh, of the digital economy is really important at this point in time. So you say that that international cooperation is key. Let's talk a little bit about that because you are the first Secretary General of the Digital Cooperation Organization. Now, your research at DCO shows that more than 70% of the new value set to be created from the global economy in the coming decade will be based on digitally enabled platforms. So what work are you doing at DCO to work with countries to ensure that all nations have the same ability to leverage the power of digitalization in order to fully achieve their goals? Well, the DCO's mission is to enable digital prosperity for all by accelerating the uh, inclusive growth of the digital economy across countries and advance their digital transformation and strengthen the collaborative efforts of our member states in the global digital economy. We believe that by sharing knowledge, experiences and best practices with each other that we can establish within our member nations the 
uh, the right infrastructure as well as policies and regulations, legislations and education solutions for the rapid creations uh, of an inclusive, equitable digital economy, which within all people, businesses and societies can innovate and thrive. We're proud and empowered by achieving a great milestone towards the globalization of the digital economy, of the DCO by becoming an observer in the United Nations. And that gives us a, uh, an access to uh, a huge opportunity to not reach uh, only uh, uh, our member states, but beyond that and empower the uh, collaboration that we call for. We have also partnered with the World Economic Forum, also in, in launching the Digital FDI Initiative to help nations accelerate their digital transformation efforts and help businesses make smarter and more informative uh, investment decisions. Uh, also, we launched a great initiative, which is uh, the Elevate 50 program, uh, how to move traditional businesses in our member states into online businesses, and that by itself powers great uh, 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 contribution to direct uh, uh, GDP and also job creation. Um, and I can go uh, on and on about how uh, uh, cooperation is really essential to add value to any initiative that we are embarking on to uh, uh, enable that growth of the digital economy. So what role do government policies and regulations play in creating more equitable digital transformation? And what are some of the key factors that need to be taken into account when designing programs and initiatives to support technology education and training? Well, we're, we're talking about a new uh, economy that is evolving, which is digital economy that is based on intangible assets as well as tangible assets. And, and that kind of economy is hovers on the infrastructure of connectivity. And that by itself does not have unified and harmonized policies and regulations yet. So therefore, we find that nations and, and, and several um, entities and continents work on um, having a, a harmonized policies and regulations that will enable innovators to create the new technologies which will in, uh, empower the, the citizens. Uh, therefore, it is important to work with other uh, organizations like the United Nations, for instance, and, and also ITU and OECD, and also work with member countries themselves to try to bring in that unified message and unified policies and regulation that will help innovators to cross border, as well as for nations to start sharing data. We, are, we have been um, uh, fortunate to, to work on several initiatives with the, uh, uh, with the UN agencies like the uh, Secretary General Envoy on Technology, where we are looking at initiatives that will complement the efforts on the uh, Global Digital Compact initiatives. And we strive to help uh, uh, governments to develop and adopt policies to create uh, innovative and uh, investment friendly and attractive environments, uh, as well as uh, we hope that uh, dec decision makers and leaders and industries, uh, uh, leaders of industries and policy makers uh, uh, would reach out and we would work with the DCO and become part of our ecosystem where we bring in governments, private sector and civil society uh, to create uh, one uh, ecosystem that can thrive and uh, leapfrog uh, and accelerate digital economy. Well, let's talk about creating an attractive environment because clearly these international talks are essential, but cost is still very prohibitive in many countries around the world when we talk about internet access and digital efforts. Uh, take a country like Tanzania, for example. A smartphone there can often cost as much as 60% of an individual's monthly income. So how have recent developments in technology, things like satellite, internet, or lower cost smartphones. How is that helping to bridge the uh, bridge the gap in the digital divide? 
Well, Katie, um, uh, if we look at the cost of connectivity right now, it is very costly. Um, and therefore, it is very difficult for nations and countries to accelerate that uh, effort in the availability uh, of the connectivity, especially in remote areas uh, in, their, uh, in their countries. Uh, and that by, uh, and also that burden of cost uh, and also effort uh, uh, in providing that connectivity demands that we look at new innovations and new ways of how can we make connectivity uh, uh, available and accelerate the uh, um, uh, the speed of uh, 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 getting people access to knowledge and also access to uh, applications for them to use and become more productive. Um, therefore, looking at innovations like satellite, as well as uh, looking at um, uh, space as a new ecosystem where we look at uh, uh, affordable and also accessible connectivity. But going back to the affordability, as you've mentioned, um, it's not enough that we are connected. Uh, we do also have a big challenge, which is the affordability of the devices and, smart, and, uh, uh, and services as well. Uh, we look at several countries that are like 98% connected, but we, we find that utilization uh, of, the, uh, of the service is only 3%. And that's because of the high cost of uh, either the devices or the services. In DCO, we are working with other governments on several projects that will uh, look into specifically uh, 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 the affordability, which is improving accessibility and reduce the cost of connectivity and build digital skills uh, through formal education programs and initiatives for people already in the workforce and help more SMEs and small and, uh, and uh, startups uh, to capitalize on the growing uh, digital economy by breaking the borders of our member countries and creating one marketplace for them uh, uh, to uh, uh, flourish in, uh, within a population of, uh, of more than 600 million that we represent right now. And ensure uh, an even playing field for all stakeholders. Now, one other big issue, uh, particularly when we're talking about developing nations as well, is data privacy and security. How can we make sure that we are securing those areas, particularly for vulnerable populations? Well, I think, uh, Katie, is, uh, the word is, is trust. And I think it's very important that we build that trust within uh, the nation itself, uh, between the citizens and the governments, as well as the governments uh, uh, together. Uh, it is very, uh, uh, that's, that's by itself is important that will enable the placement of any policies and regulations that uh, are harmonized and, and where member countries or e either the, the globe approves. Uh, and I think uh, the, uh, also the private sector has a big role uh, in such kind of uh, providing that trust. Uh, and the digital economy raises its own challenges too uh, in areas such as ethics and trust and sustainability. Uh, we have already seen the problems of uh, misinformation and, uh, uh, and misuse of uh, personal data. So having the private sector being aware and providing that trust to the citizens and users is really essential. We need to align our efforts and collaborate to accelerate digital transformation and provide common interests while developing and harmonizing, as we mentioned before, data sets for safer cross-border data flows. Uh, the DCO has adopted a, uh, a data privacy statement uh, and a call for action for AI and is working with other governments on several projects. Uh, chief among them is uh, uh, create governance and standards and uh, norms around digital, uh, around the data flows uh, and data sovereignty as well. I mean, when you talk about establishing greater trust between governments and communities, it's not always quite as clear cut as that, though, is it? 
Oh, definitely, of course. Uh, and I think it's a process. Uh, and uh, uh, I really believe that uh, by engaging the private sector uh, from the beginning with governments to co-create and co-design together uh, the right uh, policies and regulations that will enable private sector, but at the same time will protect also uh, uh, the governments and uh, uh, the citizens uh, that will accelerate that trust. And you make an interesting point about the role of the private sector there, because you've been doing some fascinating work with the World Economic Forum, looking at how to help countries uh, increase their foreign direct investment into digital economies. How can countries create a favourable environment for digital FDI and what role do governments play in this process? We've launched a collaboration with the World Economic Forum, uh, the Digital FDI Initiative, um, to identify what is the biggest challenges to growing these digital economies and help uh, implement measures that will create a digital friendly environment for foreign direct investments. Uh, so we study the, the environment and the ecosystem system of each of our member countries and we see where are the sectors that really needs and demands uh, that investment also what kind of technologies that are missing uh, that needs to be uh, um, adapted and attracted uh, uh, to come into the country. We launched this initiative already in Pakistan and, and Rwanda, uh, and we will be soon uh, launching it in all our member countries. So it is very um, uh, specific or environment specific, where the objective is to create stimulus business environments and direct the private sector or the, um, uh, the enterprises uh, to the actual opportunities and the actual need. And with foreign direct investment, we just, it, it's, ju it's not just impacting positively in terms of bringing in financials or investments to the country, but also with it comes in new technologies, uh, um, uh, skills and knowledge, uh, experience transfer, and also uh, 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 contribution to GDP and job creation. So accessibility, affordability, and really that exchange of information is going to be key. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your work personally, because you are certainly considered a trailblazer, a pioneer in your field. So I'd be interested to get your thoughts. How important do you think it is to have more women in STEM fields? Were there any cultural barriers specifically that you had to overcome in your work in promoting greater digital literacy amongst women? And what do you feel still needs to change when we look at achieving true gender parity uh, in the tech ecosystem around the world? A very important question, uh, Katie. Thank you for asking that. Um, I would say just, just imagine an AI with only a man's perspective. Uh, that would be that might uh, that would be dangerous in, in the future, and we have to have the, the uh, both perspectives. So we do have to increase the number of women scientists in AI, and involving more women in the development of these innovations and creations. So universal access to to the internet is almost fundamental for these issues. Uh, uh, and I would be talking about. That's just the beginning, which is providing the right access uh, to women. It scares me when I read reports that 350 million women will not have access to internet by 2030. And that by itself is a huge lost opportunity, not only socially, but also economically. And uh, as part of the DCO's activ activities in, in uh, last uh, uh, WEF uh, 2023, the DCO released uh, the, uh, our uh, a report, uh, which is Bridging the Gap. Uh, how better can we cooperate together to create a, a, um, a more digital, uh, inclusive uh, environment? And the report explains the barriers uh, to more equitable uh, digital transformation around the world. And the report highlights that there are there is a long way to go uh, and a long and a lot of barriers when it comes to inclusion and also um, equality uh, uh, when it comes to either accessibility to internet, either uh, the affordability of devices, and also uh, the number of women that um, uh, have a career progression 
in uh, technology or in the sectors of technology. An example on that, uh, we see in Saudi Arabia uh, that 53 per, uh, 56% of ICT graduates are women organically which is something uh, that is uh, that is very unique and uh, uh, where the world is uh, uh, facing a challenge of attracting more women and girls to science and technology. Saudi Arabia has that organically, but where is the challenge? The challenge is sustainability. After they graduate, uh, we see the re reduction within uh, women in the sector. Uh, and we have seen that Vision 2030 supported uh, uh, Saudi Arabia in, in increasing that number from 16% to now 35% women uh, in the ICT sector. Um, therefore, governments, uh, uh, the work of governments are very essential uh, to make sure that that uh, um, uh, uh, attraction uh, and sustainability of women in the sector uh, is important, uh, as well as providing the right infrastructure and skills uh, and also opportunities. And I think that sustainability is going to be key. Uh, let's talk a little bit about your work in Saudi because you're credited with helping to lead Saudi's national digital transformation. Tell me a little bit about how the government of Saudi has worked to make, uh, to make internet accessibility a little bit more affordable in the kingdom. Well, that goes back to what we mentioned before, uh, Katie, which is bringing the private sector uh, uh, into the discussion and providing that space where governments and the private sector are working together on one mission and one goal uh, and, uh, and having that mindset of moving from an egocentric approach to an ecocentric approach putting in mind the benefit and the, the interest of the private sector and vice versa. Uh, and uh, by, have, by having that uh, relationship and planning and co-creating and co-designing together, we see that acceleration within the fundamental which is the infrastructure. So we see that growth in uh, connectivity uh, in Saudi the past five years, uh, the adoption of uh, 5G as well, and the uh, introducing the new, uh, uh, new ways of connectivity for remote areas, which is uh, linking uh, homes to the sky, which was uh, first of its kind in the region. Now, uh, uh, in addition, to the policy and regulation reforms that happened uh, throughout this uh, period of time, uh, which helped in creating innovative and more flexible environments for innovators to thrive and to grow and to create new innovations, as well as attract new innovators from all around the world uh, to, uh, to set in in Saudi and see it as an environment for them to prosper. Uh, last but not least, which is skills. Uh, and he Human capital development, uh, um, uh, we've seen a, a huge uh, a partnership with NGOs as well as uh, private sector uh, in terms of uh, uh, helping and supporting and directing um, the ca human capital development uh, to uh, be aligned uh, with the uh, strategies of the private sector as well. Uh, that by itself created a, um, a, a huge uh, attractive uh, uh, leapfrog uh, when it comes to going into the, uh, or stimulating uh, youth to go into more the, um, uh, the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I think skills development is such an important factor. I know you're a big advocate of this. You are the CEO of MISC Innovation as well, Lena. You've done a lot of work in teaching coding and computer skills uh, to young people in Saudi, uh, particularly girls. I know you've had a number of initiatives to teach coding classes to women and girls in Saudi. So tell me a little bit about uh, the work you're doing with DCO in terms of other upskilling initiatives uh, to teach these new kind of skills uh, to our girls today well um, that's a that's a very sensitive uh, subject Katie I'm very passionate about it I'm actually a, a developer enthusiast um, uh, uh, I see that skills are, are, are very essential and it's not just about uh, providing the right skills uh, for our youth uh, but also uh, helping and supporting them evolve in terms of a mindset. Um, and we see that coding uh, is one of the skills um, that provides the right language uh, that will help and support in stimulating that mindset. So 
uh, coding uh, supports and, and helps in adapting a critical problem solving, uh, analytical thinking, uh, uh, and therefore uh, it, gi it's a, it gives a broader perspective of just providing that uh, skill and, and teaching how to fish. Uh, but um, uh, I really do believe that we have to work uh, with our youth on uh, how to uh, enable them with the right skills for them to create a new uh, uh, fishing tools uh, and uh, um, expand their the perspective and their mindset to uh, uh, other solutions and uh, how to analyze problems to create the right solutions. Um, throughout the years, we have been working on a lot of programs that stimulate uh, uh, such kind of mindset and as well as provide the right skills um, from establishing uh, 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 skills academies to partnering with global institutions that will help in bring in that knowledge. Uh, and also, uh, how can we uh, enable uh, continuous learning mindset and uh, make sure that uh, our youth and as well as uh, our talents in the workforce continue to grow in skills. Um, uh, and what is really important as well is passing these skills to the generations after and creating that sustainability in that uh, evolving mindset of uh, uh, innovation and and taking charge of the learning. Um, uh, one of the things that I would uh, 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 always uh, mention is uh, uh, that knowledge is the piece that you cannot take from anyone. So it is a giving. Uh, it is a giving uh, opportunity for us uh, 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 to enable uh, our youth to uh, uh, be the leaders of the future. And also, when it comes to women. Uh, giving them that accessibility to knowledge and to the platforms will enable them not just to create jobs and moving them from job seekers to job creators, but also it will give them a new perspective on globalization. I would give just a small story that I'm, I'm passionate about. Uh, in my days in Microsoft, um, uh, I met a, a, a woman that lived in a, a, a city called Atayef, uh, and uh, it was one of the uh, cities that was known for their rose uh, uh, farms. Uh, so she created products from these uh, roses. Uh, she was a widow with six kids, and she used to sell these products in all in just the the uh, city or the, the village that she was in. Uh, the thing is, she came. She wanted. She was looking for uh, trainings and uh, learning programs to help her create an e-commerce platform. So we supported her with that, and we gave her that knowledge. In three months of time, she had her uh, uh, e-commerce uh, uh, solution up online with the payment gateway uh, uh, and uh, value chain and after uh, a couple of years now she has uh, uh, um, created jobs for more than 80 women and also she uh, sells to more than 100 uh, cities and countries in the world. Wow, that is so inspiring. And I think being able to equip people with the skills can have such a big impact, not only on their own community, but certainly abroad. Very inspiring. Um, and in fact, I wanted to ask about your work at Microsoft because you were the first Saudi female at Microsoft to be assigned as a chief evangelist office for the Middle East and North Africa. So in your experience, what role do technology companies have to play in promoting better affordability to enable access to the digital economy? What does DCO do to help these companies ensure that their products and their services are accessible to all? Well, first of all, uh, Kathy, going back to the afford uh, the availability of data and the availability of the uh, the uh, quality data, uh, we see that uh, private sector by providing them the need and providing them the right data uh, for them to invest in uh, uh, in countries that will help them to prosper uh, uh, quickly and therefore provide the right uh, the right jobs and also the right uh, uh, growth opportunities for for the youth uh, and by having 
having that stimulus business environment, we will reach to a balance when it comes to the cost of services and also uh, uh, devices. Um, now, uh, second is by providing the right um, uh, 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 policy and regulation recommendation that will uh, uh, give the flexibility in terms of the cross-border uh, b- expansion for enterprises and businesses. Uh, and by removing these barriers uh, of expansion, uh, that will accelerate Uh, the availability of technologies uh, in the countries. Therefore, it will affect the prices of these services uh, uh, as well. Also, when it comes to uh, uh, increasing the number, uh, increasing the uh, manufacturing activities uh, by providing the right incentives for more um, uh, 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 service providers, hardware service providers, uh, to have more locations and expand uh, in terms of uh, markets. So the more availability and the low cost of the production of these devices, uh, the increase of the uh, uh, of the, pri- uh, the prices uh, will be lucrative uh, for them. And this is the, do- uh, the role of DCO, where we are the facilitator between the governments and the private private sector in providing also the right data and the right direction and the recommendation as being an advisor as well uh, uh, to help in uh, uh, achieving that balance when it comes to availability uh, of service and the cost or availability of devices and the cost, so the supply and demand. Well, certainly some incredible initiatives and so important in order to be able to bridge that digital divide and try and create base, uh, better economic and social equality as well. Ms. Dima al Yaya, thank you so much for joining us today on Frankly Speaking. We appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.